And welcome to session number three. Thanks so much for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, the music, in case you were listening and joined to that, I was waiting it for it to, to get beyond uh, my, my most favorite part there. But uh, it's good to be back again with you this evening. We're at session three. Hopefully you've been enjoying the trivia questions that have been uh, playing in the music when uh, logging on early. And uh, if you think you know what that uh, tune was, uh, or see a, uh, you know, a, a comment there, great music. If you think you know what the tune was, go ahead and enter it into the chat feature and we'll see how many folks uh, get, get that one right. So last week we focused on setting a secure foundation. Tonight we're gonna to focus on the retirement side of the equation. So whether you're already in retirement or hope to be there someday, uh, hopefully tonight you'll get some valuable guidance uh, on either uh, scenario. So the rules are the same as we've done before. Uh, go ahead and ask questions uh, via the chat feature. Happy to try to just address any questions that you might have. Um, and then participate also in the poll questions. We'll have one coming up here shortly. And of course, probably the most important thing is of course, laugh at my attempts at humor. Um, also wanna thank Sue again for keeping technology working uh, for us again. I think we've, we've uh, done well in the first couple of weeks and thanks to Sue. So tonight, let me just get a couple of things set up here so I can uh, pull up my other screen here. So tonight again, we're talking about um, retirement and really, you know, when we're in retirement, what does that mean and, and, and now what is really that question. So in terms of what we're going to cover tonight, uh, we're going to take a look at the financial inventory. We talked a little bit about this last week. We're, we're just going to briefly mention this again tonight. Uh, then we're going to look at the balancing act in retirement between expenses and, and income. Talk a little bit about Social Security and how that works, uh, some of the risks that we have in retirement, and then closing with seven things you need to know in retirement. So, you know, the, there's the old retirement versus the new retirement. And in the olden days, you know, there are a lot of people stop working uh, to spend a few years quietly maybe rocking on that front porch and often declining health and within several years or maybe a little bit more, often those folks would pass away. That's long, long gone, you know, that's the traditional view. Um, you know, in, in this day and age, people often spend 20 to 30 years in retirement, certainly spending more time than just sitting there rocking on the front porch and doing a lot of activities. So that's important because a lot of things uh, will, will change throughout there and you can see in the chart on the screen, the, the, on the left-hand side, the old one, um, a pension is used to be the fundamental, the foundation of what provided income to retirees. Um, that is no longer the case. If you look on the right-hand side, that's gonna be very few people uh, do have pensions providing that foundation. Social Security still has its place. And then a the nest egg at the top on the left-hand side uh, in the olden days used to have a very minimal impact, uh, meaning that the employer through the pension provided much of that retirement uh, income. Now it's, it's much different. It's the responsibility is, is really on the employee, not the employer anymore. So what we found is that over years, people are working longer than they have in the past for a variety of reasons. Some of them are because they're not financially prepared to retire, to retire when they want to. Uh, some folks enjoy working. They're passionate about what they're doing and they wanna continue doing that as long as they possibly can. Um, some that need to at least get up to Medicare age, which is age 65, and to prepare or to cover those uh, very expensive health benefits and need, need for that range. Um, and then the, the, the last one there that you see is some people want to or need to support family members uh, and need to re, you know, work longer than maybe they uh, would have in, in the past. And there's some studies out there that generally show that about three or four people who work beyond age 65 are doing so because they have to do so, not necessarily because they want to and enjoy working. So for some people, retirement is that last day that they have to work. And again, that's what that study shows about three quarters of people do. Um, and a lot of that's because again, they're not financially prepared for whatever reason up until that point in time. Uh, some people, it's the last day they want to work, which is the most ideal. You wanna go out on your own terms, of course. 
And then the, the third one listed there is the last day they can work. And uh, often because of health problems, you know, some people say, hey, I'm going to work until I'm 70 or 75 or whatever age. And just sometimes health does not allow that. So of course, out of those three options on the screen, that's probably the least ideal one. So the question then becomes, whose job is it to prepare for retirement? And of course, a spoiler alert here, it's not that retirement fairy that, that's shown there. And it's no longer the employer by providing a pension or the government with uh, expecting a lot of social security uh, from that standpoint. So we're gonna go ahead and pull up our first poll question of the evening. And the question that you should see on your screen right now says, my biggest concern about retirement is, is it A, outliving my money, B, covering the cost of possible medical, medical care later in life, C, future housing situation, D, all of the above, or E, none of the above. So go ahead and, and uh, just click on the radio button there of what is your feelings about this. Obviously, there's nothing, uh, no right or wrong answers, uh, but just curious to see where the group is shaking out. And here momentarily, we will pull up results. So we'll give another second or two here. It looks like most of you have voted, so I will pull that up. And um, the results are D, all of the above is, is what the biggest concern is. Uh, nobody uh, voted for the future housing, but um, you know, some, some folks don't have any worries there with E. Uh, but you know, th there's, again, no right or wrong answer. There's a lot of different uh, you know, concerns about retirements coming up. So uh, lots of things to, to think through as, as we go through there. So if we move along, uh, the, 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 the next thing that we're going to take a look at here tonight is, uh, is the financial inventory section. And this is exactly what we covered last week. So because we covered it last week, it, it is important again uh, throughout your life stages. So whether leading into retirement, like we talked a lot about last week, or uh, this week in retirement. So we're not going to sit here and, and spend time covering it. Uh, just a few things in the email that I sent out, I think mid last week. I sent uh, some spreadsheets out along with some video tutorials. Hopefully all of those were helpful in, um, in helping you try to put together whether it's a net worth statement, which is what's seeing right there, or the cash flow statement, which is uh, this next screen. Cash flow statement gets a little bit more tricky because you have to, you know, trying to drill down and figure out the basic living expenses. Again, those Excel spreadsheets that I sent out hopefully were uh, beneficial and helpful as uh, along with uh, perhaps even the videos. So enough on that for tonight. Again, if you have questions, please do reach out and ask. We can certainly talk through it. But moving right along, um, focusing on that balancing act between income expenses. And again, as, as I, I briefly mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, obviously in retirement, you need to make sure that retirement income can uh, cover those expenses uh, over the long term. You know, sometimes it's easy in the early years, but to really figure out and make sure that it's happening in, in, the, in the long term is important. So I'm going to go and pull up another poll question here for this evening. Um, and this next poll question reads, when in retirement during which phase is spending typically lower? So breaking uh, sort of retirement of three phases, early retirement, mid-retirement, and late retirement. So the question is, during which of those phases do you think spending is typically lower? Is it in the early stages, the middle stages, or the later stages where retirement spending is often lower? So see lots of results here. This one um, is uh, something that a lot of people feel uh, it is phase two. And I'm going to pull that up here so you can see what I'm seeing as well. So phase two, about three quarters of you uh, feel the phase two is probably where the lowest one is. So let's take a look and let's think about it. Um, let me pull that one down. And here's the three phases as it's outlined right there. And what phase one is, is what, what I often refer to as the go-go years. Again, these are the phases of, of retirement. 
where the go-go years that early, the, the phase one, it's really almost every day is like a vacation or everybody's days like a weekend. Um, your health is better, all those type of things. Uh, the slow go years is really what phase two is. And that is correct. Those of you who um, you know, answered uh, choice B there, that, that second phase is often when we do see, or a lot of people see expenses start to slow down. Um, typically from a health standpoint, sometimes that starts to slow down and maybe you're, you're less active, just less spending. Then the third uh, phase, uh, a lot of times we call those the no-go years where medical costs start to rise. And of course, that's where uh, costs start to go up as well. So as we think through um, all those type of things, the, that sort of really leads to the next question, which is how much money do I need to retire? So this is often one of the biggest questions that people will ask going into retirement. And of course, it's most, you know, it's very applicable to people leading into retirement, but also once you're in retirement, it's not, not always smooth sailing. You have to make sure that you're doing things in a manner that you are not in danger of running out of money later on. So really, there's three factors that you can see there. Your longevity, uh, how you're invested. So, you know, just for example, I know a couple of weeks ago, we talked about investments. So if you're in, in CDs, um, you better have a lot of money in your portfolio or in CDs because, you know, they're just not going to grow as much or if you're in cash. So that's the importance of investing properly uh, for your particular situation. And we'll circle back to that concept here a little bit later. And then the third area is how much spending you plan on doing in retirement. So again, that's the question is, what will my expenses be? So if we tackle that question, there's basically two ways to estimate retirement expenses. And the first way is what we refer to as the income replacement ratio. So in your book, there's a page with uh, a chart very similar to what you see on your screen, but it's a workbook style where you can actually write in your number. So again, this is one of two ways to estimate what your retirement expenses are. And as the title uh, you know, says, it's basically determining what percentage of pre-retirement income do you need for retirement. So most professionals recommend between 60 and 90 uh, percent. And a lot of times, sometimes uh, depending on your spending habits, sometimes it goes over 100 percent. So if we quickly walk through this, the chart and the example that's on the, pay, uh, on, on the screen here, we take whatever your compensation or your income, uh, this is before taxes are assessed uh, and before retirement. So if you're earning going into retirement, let's use round numbers, your family's earning $100,000 there are some expenses that can be wiped out when you retire. Uh, you're not saving into your retirement savings anymore in a 401k. Uh, Social Security, that's uh, FICA taxes. That's taxes that you have to contribute while you're working. State and local taxes, we also back out. We're not backing out federal income taxes because uh, it, any retirement income is taxable at the federal income tax level. It's not taxable if you're a Pennsylvania state resident. Uh, and, and local taxes in Pennsylvania, it's also not taxable, hence why we back that out and not federal. Uh, some work-related expenses, maybe that's clothing or you know, lunch or gasoline, those type of things uh, that, that you spend. And then maybe there's additional savings, personal savings on top of what you're putting in your retirement account. So we back all those out, we get to a number, and then we have to add some expenses that will happen after retirement. Some expenses typically go up. Uh, two of the most common are here, health insurance costs, uh, depending on what you've been paying through employment um, and what Medicare uh, plan you get and so forth. Sometimes some people see an increase in health in health insurance costs. So sometimes that goes up. And then, like I mentioned, additional leisure time activities, people just spend more time. Uh, it's sort of like the weekend where you typically during your working career, you spend more in the weekend more so typically than you do during uh, the, uh, again, during the weekday. So sometimes those go up. And so we back out some, we add some, and there's where we get. So you can see that example about 81,000. So you can choose to use the workbook um, in the printed materials or in the PDF uh, to go ahead and utilize uh, what your situation would be. Now, the second way to determine, uh, try to figure out what, is, what will your retirement expenses be is the detailed expense analysis method. Um, so the, the danger in using this method, it's often easy to forget something or to underestimate. 
So this is a snippet on the screen in the workbook. Uh, there's a full chart. This one will probably look familiar. We used this for the budgeting conversation we had last week. Um, but basically in, in this detailed expense method, you basically figure out what will I likely spend in each and every category. And again, what's on the screen is just a, a snippet of what you would see there. So a couple of different ways to figure out what your expenses are gonna be. So now that we work through that, um, now let's talk about what on the income side of that equation. So again, looking at income versus expenses, let's focus on income. And when you're getting income in retirement, there's gonna be two components. One is guaranteed, the other one is non-guaranteed. So let's start talking about guaranteed income options. And there's basically three that you can see there. Social security is of course the big one. Uh, that's something that almost everybody is entitled to. Um, that's something we're gonna circle back to here in a little bit and spend a little bit more time this evening. Uh, pensions, as I said, that's sort of a dying breed. Uh, these would be provided by employers. Uh, a lot of, you know, if you're a government employee, you still have a pension. Um, at least those of you who are further along in your career as a government em em employee. Um, school districts and so forth, all, all those type, uh, they, they still do provide pensions. Newer employees, sometimes they have some, some alternative uh, retirement methods though. So a pension is basically just uh, you know, something that's gonna give you guaranteed monthly income for, for the rest of your life. And then a SPIA, and that as you can see stands for single premium immediate annuity. And it is what it sounds like, you know, a single premium meaning that you're turning a chunk of money over to, in this case, it's going to be an insurance company um, to, for them to provide you with an immediate annuity. And an annuity and pension are somewhat interchangeable, mean the same type of thing that you're gonna buy basically yourself a guaranteed monthly income stream. So a couple things with, um, with, with pension or with, with the, the annuities or the pensions, if you uh, have one, you wanna think about what your spousal benefits might be as well. So if, if you're the spouse that has a pension, um, probably the best approach is not to say, hey, I got a pension, you don't have a pension, I'm just gonna take everything I can and when I'm gone, you know, you're on your own. Uh, so it is a good idea to select an income option and there's typically a lot of options that you can choose that will provide what's called a survivor benefit to your spouse if the owner of that pension or in the case of a SPIA passes away first. So 100% survivor benefit means that spouse A who, whose pension or SPIA that it is uh, whatever they're getting on a monthly basis, when they pass away, their spouse gets that same exact amount. They get 100% of the same amount. 75% means whatever amount they're get, the, 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 um, the owner gets when they pass away, if they, if they pass away first, their surviving spouse will get 75% of that monthly benefit and so forth. So it is normally a good idea to select an option that provides at least 67% uh, benefit, about a two thirds benefit to your survivor, uh, sur surviving spouse. Again, that, that's a rule of thumb. It all depends on your situation. So don't, if you're signing up for a pension tomorrow, don't choose that one just because Tracy said last night that that's, you know, that one or better. Really think through it, uh, talk with a, a professional to, to make sure that is best for your situation. For SPIAs, this, this last bit's only really for their single premium and then immediate annuities where you can have a death benefit add-on. And the reason that you might want to consider that, imagine you, you, you buy yourself a pension, one of those SPIAs, and uh, even if you select a survivor benefit, any of these options, and both you and your spouse pass away prematurely. Maybe it's an accident, maybe it's not, maybe it's illnesses or something else, but maybe you pass away early on and you, you, you starting your pension, or, or in this case, your SPIA, I should say, and maybe five years into starting that, uh, both of you pass away. Well, in that case, because you're turning a lump sum of money over to the insurance company, in that case, the insurance company wins. They're, they're gonna walk away with, with uh, you know, that windfall unless you added a death benefit add-on. So you can get a guaranteed period of, of either 10, 15, or 20 years. Sometimes other options are available, but you can add on a guaranteed period option that it will pay out if you both pass away in five years, it'll pay out in whatever, pay out to your beneficiaries in those remaining years. Uh, there's also what's called a refund option, which means if, if both you and your spouse, and if you had that survivor benefit, 
uh, pass away in a specific period of time, that basically the um, the principle of, of what you uh, paid for that annuity is not utilized, is not used up, that um, the re remainder that whether it be a lump sum or continued payouts can be paid, uh, continue to be paid to your beneficiary. So these add on benefits, which basically means that you're going to get a reduced monthly benefit for that. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that you're giving on top, uh, you know, any additional benefits, it's going to cost you, meaning that the monthly pay that you're going to get will be a little bit lower for any of, for any of those as well. So if we talk briefly about some of the characteristics of these SPIAs, and I'm spending a little bit of time on this because guaranteed income can be important for a lot of folks in retirement. So there are three types of single premium immediate annuities. There's the fixed type where meaning every uh, month you're going to get a fixed payout. There's inflation adjusted. So um, every year it resets and every year you get basically a pay raise. And then the third one, it's going to be variable, meaning that's really, there's going to be some underlying investments that are there. And if the market has a good year, maybe your payment will be higher. If the market went down considerably, you might get considerably lower payment. Uh, that one I would just be careful with because there's higher expenses and there's higher risk. Uh, I'm generally not a big fan of, of the variable one um, just because of the expenses and it's tied to the market. Um, the, the inflation adjusted one can be okay, but the, the benefit starts pretty low. So they have room to grow over years. Most people, I think the statistics show that most people end up with a fixed annuity over a period, you know, over the rest of their life, they're, they're picking a fixed annuity uh, from that perspective. You know, the concern, of course, is inflation as time goes along, but that's often one of the more, more common choices. And then finally, you can take retirement account money, whether it's 401k or IRA money, or non-retirement money, money that's in your bank account or money that's outside in a brokerage account to buy one of those annuities uh, from that standpoint. I'm gonna jump by uh, some of these other slides and some of these are in the book. <clears throat> and uh, those are in the book on page 102, which basically walks through some of those different, you know, what you're getting for certain rates and what is more or uh, less valuable for those. Uh, just don't have a lot of time to, to spend much on those tonight. But again, there's some information on page 102 in the book that you can certainly look about. So we talk about guaranteed um, options. Now let's talk about the non-guaranteed income options that you have in retirement. So basically these are the sources that you need to save into. So the responsibility is on, on you. Whether that's in retirement accounts, 401ks or 403bs or any of those other type of retirement accounts or individual retirement accounts, those IRAs. So in retirement, if you have some of these, you're obviously going to need to take some withdrawals from those. You can also save for the future in non-retirement accounts, whether it's bank savings, taxable accounts, brokerage accounts, all those type of things. So the next thing along these very veins that vein that I want to talk through is what's called a safe withdrawal rate. So let's take an example. Um, you're going to, you know, you retire, you have a 401k or an IRA, and you need to take um, money from those accounts to, to live on. Let's assume you don't have a pension. Um, there, there's what's referred to in the industry we call a safe withdrawal rate. So if you say, okay, I'm going to take 10% out of that balance, you know, out of my 401k in year one of retirement. Well, if you think about it, if you take 10% on year one and you have 20 or 30 years in retirement, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, well, you know, you're going to run out of money at some, uh, some point in time. So that's what we refer to as safe withdrawal rates. Um, in terms of, of, of uh, with that, the, the safe withdrawal rate that, that there's the industry sort of standard is, is a 4% of the account value. And so what I mean by that, and, and it's also inflated for future years. So if I use an example, say you have a retirement account or your nest egg in total, let's use round numbers. Let's say you have a uh, million dollar portfolio. In year one, if you take a safe withdrawal rate of uh, 4%, that would be $40,000, 4% of a million dollars, $40,000 in year one. Every year thereafter, you can take 3% in addition to keep up with inflation. So year two, you're taking out 41,200. 
the next year 42,000 and change and so forth. So that's what we refer to as a safe withdrawal rate. And what uh, has the, the studies have proven and the chart that I'm gonna now go to um, will show what are their successes of those initial withdrawals. So lots of numbers here. And at the top it says, you know, success rates for a portfolio to last 30 years. So if we focus on the 4% row, withdrawal rate of 4%, you also see at the top, um, the numbers with the slashes there, that's the investment portfolio. So 100% stocks, no bonds. 75% stocks, 25% bonds. 50, 50, 25, 75, and zero, 100. And what you'll see on the 4% uh, withdrawal rate line, that there's a 94% probability of success or success rate uh, for a portfolio that's invested at 100% to last 100% equities to last over 30 years. If, if in year one, you take 4% and then each successive year, you take 3%. If you invest 75-25, uh, that percentage actually goes up and even more so if you're 50-50. And, and we've always had people ask in the past, well, the more aggressive you are, shouldn't that be a higher percentage? Uh, in general, it will be, but, and some of these lower percentages, you see that is the case. Here in the 5% and the 6 and 7%, the higher probability is in that area. But in some ways, uh, that, that additional risk of, of investing at 100% equities, there's a lot more volatility. There's a lot more ups and downs. So sometimes it doesn't work out that 100% stocks will get you to the end line uh, better than it will being a little bit more moderate or a little bit more conservative in that, that area. Um, so what you see here in green are the probabilities of success that are over 80%. And I would feel pretty good about you know, an 80% probability. You see in 3%, no matter almost how you're invested, if you take 3% out in year one and inflate it every year thereafter, you should be in pretty good shape. 4% is, is, is quite good too, except if you're going to put everything in bonds or put everything in a bank or CDs or something like that. It's probably not going to get the job done for you. Uh, when you start taking 5 6 or 7% out in year one, that starts to be a pretty big draw. And depend, you know, especially if you have more conservative investments, your probability of making it is uh, a lot lower, so much lower confidence. So that, that's a uh, pretty important thing to, to think about. So changing gears here a little bit, um, going to talk about now staying in, in the thought of withdrawing, but bringing taxes into the equation and, and talking about a tax efficient withdrawal strategy. So um, you know, one of the things when we're saving for retirement, it's not easy, but we can, um, you know, you, you sort of start saving, save whatever percentage it is. You got to find what funds you're saving in your 401k and you set it up and hopefully it's a set it and forget it type of a thing. But then when you retire, flipping that switch from saving to taking money out, all of a sudden it, it somewhat paralyzes a lot of people. Um, and this is where finding a good advisor, somebody that can help you through it is, is often well worth it. So, and doing it in a tax efficient way is very important. So here are a couple of things on the screen that often gets uh, you know, pretty important. And these are really, really from those non-guaranteed income options that we were talking about. So any of your investment accounts. So if you have a taxable account, a brokerage account, individual or joint account, uh, you can take dividends from, from those. You've been, uh, most people during their working career reinvest any dividends or the interest from those accounts. So you can start taking those. Uh, you're paying taxes regardless if you're reinvesting it or taking it. So that's often the first line of defense. Uh, then often you can take needed distributions from the taxable accounts. Again, not from your retirement accounts, because again, 401ks and, and IRAs, typically when you take money out of those, you got to pay ordinary income taxes on those. So um, that's where taking uh, distributions from there, typically there's a cost basis and the tax consequences are typically more favorable capital gains. Uh, defer retirement accounts as long as you can, uh, because again, those retirement accounts are something that anything you take out of there, you got to pay full income taxes. A and then uh, Roth accounts, because Roth uh, IRAs, I think we talked about them a little bit last week, where there's tax-free appreciation, often best to save those for less, so the appreciation continue to, can continue to go grow uh, tax-free from that one. Um, and then the, the last bit of advice with uh, withdrawal strategies is to, to get in a schedule and take periodic payments rather than as-needed withdrawals. 
when taking as needed withdrawals, that means, okay, I'm gonna take X number of thousand dollars out of my account today. And whenever I need money, the next time I'm going to, to take more money out. Uh, if, if, you, if you're not careful at the end of the year, you look back and say, wow, I took a lot more out than I thought I did. So it's better to sort of set up a paycheck, a retirement paycheck, and that's what those periodic payments are. Uh, most people take a monthly, some might delay to quarterly, but getting those regular payments um, and trying to live with those payments and set a plan so you know exactly what can you afford. Here's what I can afford to take out on an annual basis. Let me divide by 12 and take that on a monthly basis. So on the um, still on the income uh, strategy topic in retirement, uh, the bucket strategy. This is something that that resonates with with some people. Some like this, some don't. Again, there's not a right or wrong way to do it, but some people sort of divvy up their their assets into into three different buckets. The short term bucket is really what's the closest, maybe uh, what's coming within the next five years. So they might take five years worth of expenses and put it in here. Uh, invested very conservatively. Some of that will be in cash. Maybe some will be in short term bonds or bond mutual funds. The intermediate bucket is normally the next area out. You know, maybe that's the five to 10 year bucket. And as obviously you start depleting the short term, this becomes closer. Um, and then the longer term bucket, maybe that's for 10 years and plus out, and that can be invested even more aggressively. However, you know, it makes sense to you. There's, there's good uh, you know, pros and cons of doing almost any financial strategy, this one included. So the next thing I wanna talk about on the expense side of the equation is something we, we've talked about, it, I think, both of the first two weeks, and this is the needs versus wants. Um, so when we think about needs, those, you know, those are groceries, utilities, housing, uh, all those things that obviously we need to spend money on for survival. Uh, wants are the discretionary expenses. Uh, you know, maybe that's entertainment, hobby, some of the other things that you don't need, but you want. So essential expenses, sort of the left side of this screen right here, um, there, there can be some merit to this. And especially those people who have uh, access to pensions, a lot of times, if you can cover your essential, those needs with social security and pension, that's a great way to set up your retirement income stream. Now, most people, especially in recent years that don't have pensions, it's very tough to do that. Um, so if you do have a pension, you might be able to cover your essential or those, those needs with social security and pension and then supplement the discretionary spending with other savings that you may have. Um, again, most people aren't gonna be retiring with a pension. So what you need to do is some of the other investments are going to bleed on over there, meaning that you're going to have to use some of those for, uh, to cover essential expenses. But the point is when you're looking at expenses, figure out what you need and what you want. And hopefully you can obviously cover what you want that's why you're working so hard and, and, and going into retirement and hopefully planning well um, a, a, along that, that area. So the next question that we typically ask is, um, am I on track? And there's two ways to figure out if you're on track. And one of those is now what you're seeing on the screen right now, which is yet another question. When will your nest egg run out? So again, the ultimate question we're trying to figure out, am I on track? And, and this is, uh, th there's two versions and there's a worksheet that I'm going to email you uh, in coming days on this one. It's gonna be an Excel worksheet. I'll also send out the tutorial video to go along with it. And hopefully that will um, you know, be beneficial in trying to help figure out what that is. But there's two, there's two uh, versions. This one here, if you can see my mouse, I'm circling here, the, the working person version. Uh, there's also a retired person version. So if you're in retirement and you're trying to figure out how much longer will my nest egg last, uh, you would use that version, of course. So the, the, the spreadsheet is, is put together uh, in a way that you can only, I think you can only type in into the gray areas and you can uh, you know, uh, change any of those, those data points that are there. I'm not gonna go any, in, in any depth uh, uh, tonight with that, but there is, I think, a tab with instructions on it, and there's uh, the tutorial video that hopefully is, is beneficial. And I'm sort of curious uh, if, if anybody feels like those, uh, if you've been using any of the spreadsheets from last week, or if you think the spreadsheets and the videos are, are helpful. I've heard from a few folks, but if it is, feel free to send me a note just to let me know if it is helpful or if it's not helpful, 
or just uh, put a note into the, the chat feature uh, for, from that standpoint. So um, that, that's the one question. The second question uh, or the second way to determine basically what you uh, will need in retirement is to address the question of what's your number? So this is, this is gen generally one that uh, retirees are probably going to struggle with a little bit, uh, but in terms of um, for, for pre-retirees, uh, fi figuring out from that standpoint. So a safe withdrawal rate. So uh, we, we, we talked about that and you can see I'm using a 4% safe withdrawal rate. It's really a three-step process to figure out if you're pre-retirement, what do you need to have saved in order to retire. So for this example, I just use a 4% withdrawal rate. If you're going to retire earlier than, than maybe normal retirement age, you want to use a lower uh, safe withdrawal rate because your retirement's likely going to be much longer. If you retire later, if you retire at 70 or 75, you can probably increase your safe withdrawal rate uh, from, from that standpoint. So a couple things uh, worth saying on this one, um, you know, the second step of it, again, first year withdrawal from your nest egg, you need to find, figure out what am I going to be pulling from uh, my nest egg? And some of the earlier conversations we've already had tonight, some of those other spreadsheets or worksheets are designed to uh, get you there, um, trying to figure out what that number is. So the third step of the process is simply to take uh, B divided by A. So take that $50,000 in this example, withdraw from your nest egg, divide it by whatever that safe withdrawal rate is. In this case, 4% would be 0 0.04, and you get to what that number is. So if you get um, to retirement, you need one, uh, million to, one and a quarter million dollars. In year one, you're going to take 4% of that, which is the 50,000. Obviously, the math works out well. Uh, in the workbook, uh, in the PDF and also in the printed materials. And I know, again, the printed materials do not have any page numbers. I apologize on that. But uh, in, in uh, 108 of the PDF or in your printed materials, you can uh, obviously find where that's at. There is uh, sort of a workbook-like activity to, to get there. So to have a little fun with this, I'm going to be very transparent and share with you what my number is. Um, so before I do that, there's a question uh, that says, how do you account for inflation with these numbers, especially if retirement is a longer time away? That is exactly why uh, that, that safe withdrawal rate, you know, as I mentioned, that includes inflation protected. So numerous studies have been do done in the past that 4% is generally a safe withdrawal rate, meaning that you can take 3% year after year uh, with those. Uh, so that's why it's fairly low, because if you think about it, say you're earning five or six percent of your investments and you're only taking out four percent. Well, you can do the math. Your account's going to continue to grow. But in year one, if you're taking four percent and then every year thereafter, inflation starts to increase and you're taking more and more. That's all factored into the calculation. So it simplifies uh, that from that one. So very, very good question. Thank you for asking. So so to, to clarify. Um, so let's take a look at, 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 at my situation. Like I said, I'm going to be fully transparent. So what's, what's Tracy's number? You know, my safe withdrawal rate. Uh, so, you know, I, I haven't shared this yet with Nicola, but um, at, the, at the end of this month, um, my goal is to retire. And of course, since I'm very young, I'm going to need a very safe withdrawal rate. Uh, so I'm going to go to two and a half percent. So again, the younger you retire, the lower your safe withdrawal rate is. And I also have pretty high ambitions for retirement. So I would say that probably $2 million per year, that's my, or that's my first year withdrawal should do. So you can see uh, there on the left-hand side, you know, I, I imagine Nicola's gonna spend most of her time riding the horse and I'll probably tend to my stable of, uh, of cars over there. So I figured, $2 million should do it. So remember the math is basically taking B divided by A. So when we do that math, that basically comes out to $80 million. So off to you know, count what's currently my piggy bank, I might be a little short of that, that 80 million to be able to retire at the end of the month, but uh, we'll, uh, I guess we'll off to, to, uh, to count and see where that comes out. So then the question is, well, what if I'm not on track? So there are um, eight different things generally that you can do if you're not on track. 
Uh, you can certainly work longer. You can inflate your withdrawals less, meaning whatever you take in year one, you don't take more in subsequent years or uh, take less in subsequent years. You can take on more risk and try to go for the stars and get that, that higher rate of return. That's a risky proposition. You can save more while you're still working. Uh, you can do a reverse mortgage. We'll talk about that at some point. Uh, you can also spend less. That's one way to do it. Uh, so maybe that would help me uh, to spend less than, than $2 million a year. Um, you could also die sooner. Not going to recommend that. Again, you don't have much control over that. And the other option is that you could work part time. So the ones with the red asterisks are really the ones that you probably have some control over working longer, working part time in retirement, uh, saving more or spending less. And so I think to reach my number, I might uh, choose to work a little bit longer until I can get to that $80 million number. So, um, so Nicola will probably be happy that I'm not gonna be fully retired at the end of this month. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to make that goal. She made a comment in the chat feature, don't worry, she got me covered. So hopefully that is the case. All right, so let's move along. We're gonna talk social security here. Um, and we're not gonna get into in, in much weeds here. Uh, back in 2015, social security changed uh, considerably. There used to be a lot of fancy strategies. Today, it's much more simple in terms of uh, trying to generate the, the most out of it. For the average retiree, uh, Social Security replaces about 40% of needed income. For some, it's more, for others, it's less. Uh, but that's general statistics, about 40% of retirement income is replaced by Social Security. So one of the questions you should know is, well, when is your full retirement age? So depends on when you were born. And uh, this has been phasing from 66 up to 67. So the last group uh, to retire at age 66 was in 2020. Those folks uh, turned 66 in 2020 that were in that grouping. Uh, and if you're 60 or younger, your answer is 67. That's your full retirement age. Uh, born in 1960, but of course you're 60 um, this year, or you, you, you're already 60, of course, uh, would be that one. So that's when your full retirement age is. So full retirement age can be important because if you are younger than full retirement age, there's something called a social security earnings test. So if you're younger than your full retirement age and you have earned income of greater than about $19,000 in 2021, and you're collecting social security benefits, you're gonna lose some value. You're gonna lose a dollar of every $2 above of your social security benefits above that, that limit. So again, if you're younger than full retirement age and you're working and you have earned income, that's underlined uh, because you have to have earned income of, of 19,000 or more, it's not gonna be worth taking social security. And that's the bottom line. Wait, in that case, wait until you're retired or that you're full retirement age before beginning those social security benefits there. So I'm gonna pull up a, another poll question here. So bear with me here. Um, and this one is about Social Security. So a lot of debate um, about Social Security, and you probably have seen studies out there that the trust fund of Social Security is projected to run dry in the early 2030s. Uh, so the question, as you can see, is for sustainability of Social Security retirement benefits, I feel that A, the fund's going to run out of money in, in the next 20 years, resulting in a reduced benefit that you might get uh, X number of cents on the dollar, or B, Social Security problems will continue to be kicked down the road, but ultimately it's going to pay your full benefit. So go ahead and enter what your feelings are on that one. And we'll see if we have a bunch of optimists or some pessimists uh, here with us today. So the numbers are trending. And I'll end the poll, poll, uh, poll now. It's about a two thirds to one third um, ratio. So about two thirds of you feel that's going to be continue to be kicked down the road, but you're going to get full benefits uh, from that one. Who really knows what the answer to that one is, but that may be the case. Um, in terms of um, the, the next section, there can be benefits in delaying Social Security. For every year that you delay beyond your full retirement age, there's an 8% step up uh, percentage step up every single year. So if we use this, this bottom one, let's assume that, that you know, your full retirement age is 67. If you see over here, um, down close to the bottom right corner, 67, you're gonna get 100% of your full retirement age benefit. 
Well, if you wait to age 70, and over here on the right hand side, um, that's going to be 124%. Again, it goes up by 8% for each year you delay. And conversely, if you take it early prior to your full retirement, you get a penalty. And a penalty is six, seven to eight percent, uh, six, seven to eight percent range uh, per year that you take it early. So if you take it at age 62 and your full retirement age is 67, so you're taking five years early, your benefit's going to be 70 percent. Um, that's what your benefit's going to be there. So uh, just some things to think about as you uh, go along throughout there. There are some divorced and survivor spouse benefits, and I'm going to sort of jump through this very quickly. Um, if you are divorced, your divorce needs or your, your, your marriage needs to last at least 10 years. Uh, you may be entitled to benefits. Uh, there's some caveats through there. Both ex-spouses 62 years old or older. Uh, Larry King, who obviously just passed away recently, he was married seven different times. And to be fair, his third and fifth wife were actually the same person. So really six different spouses. However, none of those six spouses, uh, ex-spouses get divorce benefits because none of them uh, were married to him for longer than 10 years. So 10 years is that magic part. Survivor benefits, it depends on when the person, uh, you know, if your spouse passes away, it depends on if they pass away prior to taking Social Security or after taking Social Security. If they take, uh, pass away after Social Security, uh, the survivor spouse will get the higher of the two benefits. Uh, there's information in the book about uh, if they pass away prior to, uh, to claiming Social Security. Uh, spousal benefit um, is, is uh, that was a survivor benefit I was just mentioning. Spousal benefit uh, talks about, you know, a spouse that might have not been working and is, is more of a uh, stay-at-home uh, spouse that uh, can get 50% benefit of the, of, of the spouse that was working uh, their benefit. There's uh, ways to do that uh, from there. There's some examples in the book on that one. Like I said, Social Security change in 2015 happened uh, that made some of those, those fancy uh, trying to some uh, uh, ways to take, uh, get, get more out of it uh, have, have uh, dissipated from us. And then the bottom question is really, when should I take benefits? Again, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, I debate clients on this uh, quite quite often and, and give them some things to think about on that. You know, if you need, if you're a full retirement age and you need the income and you're retired, I would take it. Um, you know, if you have other substantial assets and you can have it step up, meaning that 8% uh, step up and, and at least one of the two spouses, if you're married, can wait to age 70 to lock in that higher the two benefits, that's always good as well. Basically, the system is designed that uh, for your life expectancy, if you pass away on your life expectancy and you take it at full retirement age, that's what it's uh, based on. If you pass away prior to life expectancy, uh, you might be better taking it sooner. If you pass away after, you're better delaying it. The chances are that uh, for a married couple, at least one of you will pass away after your life expectancy. Therefore, that can argue for at least one of you to delay to age 70, possibly a lot of different things to think about. And again, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, there's also an example in the book on that very with Andy and Alice. I'm going to jump by this right now, uh, right now for time's sakes, but that's uh, out there as well. Uh, you can see in the book. So let's move along to some risks in retirement. And one of the first risks is sort of what we were just talking about. How long are you going to live that longevity? So here's Joe and Jane. If you were tuning in before, I think there was a, a, a question on the uh, trivia slides on this one, but they're married both uh, age 65 and 2021. And we focus on a 50% uh, probability line. Uh, Joe being the male of a non-smoker, his life expectancy at 50% is 88 years old. Jane is 90 years old. Well, either of them Again, uh, the, the expectancy is, is that one of them will be alive at age 93, and the chances of both of them being alive at age 83, that's what the 50% probability is. So again, that's the, uh, the expectancy there. If we move along, talked a little bit about inflation as well. You all know what that is. You can see on the chart that as years go along, these are five-year increments, 30,000 here turns into something much higher as time goes along. So something to, uh, to think about. This next chart focuses, again, bringing back that conversation of that's that initial withdrawal rate, that safe withdrawal rate that we talked about. 
So if your initial withdrawal rate, a safe withdrawal rate, say a 4% out of year one out of your retirement nest egg, and inflation's at 3%, those assets might last 40 plus years. And again, it depends on how it's invested and there's some assumptions at the bottom of the screen and in the book. But if inflation instead of 3% is now all of a sudden 5%, obviously there's some years that's gonna be shaved off. That gets even more severe, of course, if you take higher amounts out of your portfolio and your initial withdrawal rate is higher, a five or 6%, you can see where those numbers start to dwindle. So inflation is important uh, to go along with those initial withdrawal rates. Again, the 4% safe withdrawal rate comes with a 3% inflation rate built in. And that's where, generally speaking, for most situations, it will last a substantial amount of time. The other thing that I referenced a little bit earlier was asset allocation. So again, these were talking about risks in retirement. Uh, it, it, you know, there can be a risk of running out of assets too soon if you invest too conservatively. Some people think I'm gonna retire and put everything to bank CDs. And unfortunately that does not end well unless, the, unless you just have a boatload of money, it's not gonna be there. It can also happen if you invest too aggressively. So you wanna have that moderate asset allocation. So there are really two things that think about. Uh, risk tolerance uh, on is, uh, is um, in terms of stomaching, uh, you know, if you can stomach the volatility, that's what risk tolerance really refers to. Um, so can you sleep at night, get through all those type of things. The other part of it is risk capacity. So that's basically is, do you have an ability uh, to experience uh, that volatility without affecting your standard of living? So if you have substantial amounts of money, you could probably make the argument, well, I have the risk capacity. You might not have the risk tolerance, but you might also have that risk capacity uh, that, that's out there. The other thing, uh, like I said, you know, if you're investing very conservatively, um, you know, that, that might uh, hurt. If you're investing too aggressive, it might as well. So sometimes that moderation. We talked about the rule of thumb a couple of weeks ago. If you subtract your age from 110, that gives you the uh, approximate amount that, that the average person would have in the stock market uh, in, in the equity portion. So something else that sometimes happens, what if you retire at a bad time? And uh, a lot of people retired at a bad time in 2008, um, if we think back at that point in time. And there's, uh, you know, here's a quick scenario. Account balance at retirement of, of $100,000 um, is, is in this example what's there. And they're taking an annual with withdrawal of 5,000. That's obviously a 5% initial withdrawal rate, right? And adjusted for 3% inflation every year. So we have Sue and John, both in that same situation. They're taking out with a 5,000 uh, over a 20 year stretch they're, and with that inflated at 3%, they're each taking out the same amount a little over $334,000 over the 20 year period of time. Now here's the difference between Sue and John. They average 6% over the 20 years. So their average return is 6% over this 20 years. But in year one, Sue has a, a great year and John has a, a negative year. That is the opposite on the back end. Sue has the negative year at the end in year 20 where John has a great year. So the question is, are, are, do they have the same amount of money after 20 years or does one have more than the other? And I'm going to ask that via poll question here and let's see what y'all think. So the question simply is, in this example, who ends with a higher account balance after 20 years? Is it Sue or is it John? Again, Sue had the good first year, negative last year, John had to reverse, but over that 20 year period, they had the same average return. So go ahead and submit your answers. I'm seeing uh, lots of answers come through here. All right, so we have so far people uh, voting for all three. The one that's gonna come out on top is, is actually going to be the right answer here. And I'll pull that up. And in conjunction, I'm gonna slide the screen along here and pull this off or out of the way, but I know it's covering it up. So let me sh stop sharing the results. But the poll, uh, almost 63% uh, said that Sue would end up with more. And you are absolutely right. Sue does end up with more. And again, it's because that first year. So if you retire and that first year is a negative, even at, at, at the end of 20 years, if you're averaging back up, you're building off of a lower base. And you can see John's going to end up with half of what Sue uh, ended up with. So that is a bit of a tough situation uh, for there. So um, 
trying to, to move along here, um, a couple things here. This was a slide on a trivia. Fidelity came out with a study they do it uh, every, I think every other year, where they expect that most people spend almost $300,000 for a typical retired couple age 65 uh, to spend um, on health care, not including a potential long-term care in retirement. That's a big number. Um, we're going to talk about long-term care here momentarily, but before we do, bridge health insurance. Uh, so if you want to retire prior to, to Medicare, Medicare again starts at age 65. If you want to retire prior to Medicare, you need to think about what you're going to do for health care between when you retire at age 65. Here are some options. COBRA, um, which is something you can stay on your employer plan for about 18 months after your retirement. That's often the best option out of the gate. You might be able to negotiate with your employer to say, hey, I've worked here for a long time. Can I uh, you know, stay on your plan? I'll pay, pay the full cost, but, I, but can I stay on, on the plan? COBRA, you're also paying the full rate, by the way. Um, that negotiation likely won't go so well, but it's worth a shot. If your spouse is still working, that's one way to do it. If your spouse is not working, uh, trying to get an individual policy uh, through healthcare.gov or something like that can be uh, a way to do it as well. So moving along, want to talk about healthcare needs uh, in retirement and long-term care uh, of what that is. That story has changed a lot as well. Uh, but health and disability insurance, sometimes people think that that's going to cover long-term care needs. Uh, long-term care insurance doesn't, but it's, or it does, but it's very expensive. And health insurance does not cover going into getting care in a facility, uh, in a longer-term care facility. Uh, and, and we're going to you know, work through a couple questions here very quickly. So the odds of needing long-term care, about 70% of, of people over age 65 need some type of long-term care. That does not mean ending up necessarily in a, uh, a, nur a skilled nursing facility from that standpoint. Assisted living could be part of that. In-home care is becoming much more common these days as well. Uh, but again, that cost can really wipe out a uh, surviving spouse or in some cases even put a burden on the next generation. Uh, so then the next question is, can the government pay for my long-term care needs? Medicare does not. Uh, Medicare sometimes will cover uh, a few days on the front end. If you are in a hospital or in a, a rehab facility, they will cover some portion of it. Uh, typically, I think it's 30, 60, 90 days. It doesn't get you very far, very short period of time. Medicaid, that's another uh, government program, will kick in basically if you really spend uh, your assets, if you're single, spend them down to virtually nothing. And if you are a couple, they have you spend it down to about $100,000 where then they try to capture it later. So don't rely on the government to, uh, to cover long-term care. So what does that cost? So long-term care, this is a study uh, just last year in the Harrisburg area uh, by Genworth a semi-private room in a nursing home, and this is a full, full nursing home, it's about 120K a year, a little bit over. For a private room, it's about 130. Uh, you can see assisted living, home health aides uh, from some of these. These are pretty serious dollars. Um, you know, and, and a home health aid, it has some statistics that's based on 44 hours per week. If you need around the clock home health care, all of a sudden that number is going to go up significantly as well. So it's a very expensive proposition. So you think about how can I co cover those costs? You know, personal assets, Medicaid, uh, care by family members, if you're lucky enough to have family members that can care for you. Uh, again, Medicaid, you're basically you know, spending down all your other assets, so that's not a great way to do it. Uh, but then you can get long-term care uh, insurance, pure long-term care. There's something I put in here called hybrid long-term care slash life insurance that's becoming more popular, I would say, in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, because if you, you know, with pure long-term care insurance, if you don't use it, you lose it. And obviously you don't want to use it, uh, but it becomes fairly expensive. The hybrid policy is if you need long-term care, you can, you can use it. And if you don't, whatever you don't uh, use, it gets wrapped up to a life insurance policy and goes to the, the next generation there. So uh, what is the cost of long-term care insurance? Here's quotes that are ran about a month or two ago. Uh, for it, you can see the age of purchase, the longer you wait, the more expensive it goes. You can see that males are cheaper than females. Uh, there is a premium discount for uh, a couple there. Now, in terms of uh, the next poll question here that I'm going to pull up, why do women pay more than men for long-term care insurance? 
So again, the question is why do women pay more than men for long-term care? Is it because A, they're more needy than men? And men, I would advise you, if you're sitting there with your, your spouse, uh, whoever has the clicker, uh, you might want to be careful what you're clicking on there. But A, is it they are more needy than men? Or B, they live longer than men? And so far, the results, I'm going to end it before somebody makes a wrong answer. Um, and everybody did answer. They live longer than men. So that is the absolute correct answer. Um, in terms of that one, that is why women will pay more for substantially higher. Yeah, you can see it's not even close. Um, so the next uh, item, you know, to, to talk about what should you look for in long term care in the booklet, there's some information to look for in terms of the benefit period, uh, inflation protection, uh, some other things. There's uh, th that's that's an important thing to think through and look through. Uh, and when should you begin planning for that? Age 60 is often a good point of time to, uh, to think about that. So we're gonna move along to uh, life insurance transition. As I said last week with life insurance, there's not one size fits all solution for, uh, for life insurance in, in any way, shape or form. Um, so, you know, uh, you know do, do retirees need life insurance? Maybe, maybe not. Again, it depends on your goals, and, and I would encourage you to discuss that with a professional. Make sure uh, you, you do the right thing for your situation. But often in retirement, there are three reasons that a lot of times people do need life insurance. So if you need to provide income for a surviving spouse. So as an example, say spouse A has substantial retirement income via a pension um, that doesn't continue paying anything to spouse B when spouse A dies. That's a good reason to get life insurance on spouse A. That income stream will disappear. Spouse B might need something to, to continue to go uh, living on. Uh, if you want to guarantee a legacy, as long as you're paying the premiums, that's a great way to guarantee a legacy, that there's going to be something paid out there. Um, I would encourage folks to consider, you know, if you want to leave a legacy to Dairy uh, Presbyterian, you know, you can get a life insurance policy with Dairy as the beneficiary. And I'm sure there's people that already have that. That's, that's a fairly common thing. Uh, you might just not want to tell Pastor Stephen or Treasurer Stephen uh, that you have that because they might uh, put a bounty on your head and think that you're worth more dead than alive. But uh, and just kidding, of course, uh, on that one. And the, the last uh, reason to have life insurance in retirement is for estate planning purposes. If, they're, if you're exposed to estate taxes, uh, I think uh, George might be getting into that a little bit in two weeks from now. Uh, or for state liquidity purposes. So typically some of those reasons there. Now, we talked last week about term life insurance sometimes being better than permanent life insurance while you're working. It's generally gonna be the opposite in retirement. A term life policy that expires at some point before you pass away is probably not, is not gonna do any good uh, for, for those reasons. So having a permanent policy, and what you see here in the screen is a range of uh, risk levels with the guaranteed policies, the less risky ones on the left and the, uh, the, the non-guaranteed ones, the more risky ones on the right-hand side. I uh, don't want to just you know, make a blank, blanket statement saying you never want to be in some of the ones on the right-hand side, but just be very careful. Uh, before um, working with Connor at Siegel for going on 15 years, I worked for Lincoln Financial Group in uh, the life insurance, and they were uh, picked up the phone a lot of times and took calls from people uh, that were in their 80s that had some of these old policies, the, some of these, these more risky policies that were uh, designed in the 1980s, and, and they started to what I call blow up meaning somebody in their 70s or 80s got a notice in the mail saying, hey, you've been paying $1,000 a year premiums in life insurance. Uh, it's no longer going to cut it. And if you want to keep this policy, you have to now start paying five or 10000 or whatever the number is, substantial increases. And a lot of people on fixed incomes, they just can't afford it. And then they just, you know, after years of paying in, they, they let it lapse. There's some a lot of cost, a lot of expenses in some of these based on some assumptions that just aren't realistic. The one on the left, guarantee no lapse universal. Those are the safest ones because as long as you pay the premium, um, you're going to get that paid out over that period of time. So again, the point is just to be careful of what you're doing. Um, again, mentioned permanent life insurance is, is the, the best uh, type to use in retirement. A couple of different types you can consider. First to die a joint policy. It's what it sounds like it is. Uh, it's beneficial when, if you need to provide the second spouse with some income for that surviving spouse, uh, that's, that's the way you want to go. Uh, second spouse 
is to guarantee a legacy to whether your heirs or to charities, or if you need estate planning purposes, uh, that's where that would be there. We talked last week about umbrella insurance. Uh, we're gonna jump ahead and, and skip through that one right now. And we're gonna uh, finish up tonight with uh, seven things you need to know in retirement. So uh, the first one, it's technically it's only gonna be six and you'll, you'll see why momentarily. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first one here is rolling 401ks into IRAs. So for the most part, uh, when people retire, if you take that 401k, you put it into an IRA, uh, it's generally advantageous for uh, a handful of reasons. You first of all, you take control of that account. When it's still in your, you know, your employer's retirement plan, they're still in control. I mean, it's your money, but they're still in control. They control the plan rules. So, in an individual retirement account, it's yours, and there's not, you know, not really any any uh, restrictive rules throughout there. There's also increased investment choices um, that you have in IRAs. It's generally most IRAs have a wide open universe. You can invest in almost anything you want um, in, in that space where 401ks have limited choices. Uh, IRAs also have more flexibility with distribution. Again, sometimes 401ks, they have some rules. 401k rules are generally designed that the employer, once you retire, they want you out of the plan. So they often design the plan because it's a, it's a uh, an expense basically you know to them uh, to pay the provider. They often pay a per participant expense. So they want you off the book. So they often have rules that make it more difficult to take withdrawals. IRAs complete flexibility. You can take money whenever you want. And then the last one, you know, if you have multiple retirement accounts, you can put them all together, uh, and you can just consolidate those and makes withdrawals easier as well. So just one thing to think through. Um, the, the next uh, item, the next thing you, you need to know is that RMDs, required minimum distributions is what they stand for. Um, so this changed recently. You must take uh, required distributions out of your uh, employer sponsored plans and traditional IRAs starting at age 72, uh, up to a year and a couple months ago, that was age 70 and a half, the year you turned age 70 and a half. That is now the age that you turn 70 72. Um, note that that's not applicable for Roth IRAs. And if you're still working, it's not available or it's not applicable for your employer plan. So if you're still working beyond age 72, uh, you do not have to take money out of your employer plan if you're still working. And again, it's not applicable for Roth IRAs whatsoever. Uh, but you can see here, here's the different age ranges. Here's the percent that you're required to take out. So at age 72, you have to take out what amounts to 3.9% of your portfolio in year one. That's universal. Every year goes by, you have to take out a higher percentage. So when you're 80, you're taking out over 5%. When you're 90, you're taking over 8.5%. And when you hit 100, you're taking out about 15.87%. The table goes the whole way up until uh, age 120. Uh, so if you live to age 120, which I bet you at least uh, five of you listening on the call uh, what we'll do, you will uh, have to drain your retirement accounts at age 100 at that point. Uh, we have a question that comes in. It says, if I turn 72 in September, do I have to take the RMD this year or next year? So again, it's the year that you turn 72. So if you turn 72 in 2021, you have to take an RMD for year 2021. Now, the caveat is your first year of taking withdrawals, you can actually delay until April 1st of the following year. So, you know, in, in the year you turn 72, that first year, you can technically wait to take it until a, uh, up to April 1st of the following year. Uh, subsequent years, you don't. Typically, what we say, just take it in, in, in age 72, because if you wait to the beginning of the following year, guess what? When you're 73, you're going to have to take a required distribution as well. Uh, and if you don't need that money, now you're taking two distributions and maybe raising your tax bracket by taking two required distributions in one calendar year rather than having one at age 72 and one at age 73. So that's a very good question. Uh, three, Roth conversions. Um, there's a lot of debate about Roth conversions uh, that are out there. They used to be a little bit more, um, uh, more common or, or a lot more talk about them. There's a lot of information in the booklet that you can uh, take a look at in the materials about it. But when you make a Roth conversion, keep in mind, you're gonna pay Uncle Sam a large tax bill depending on how much you're converting to a Roth. A Roth conversion is taking money from a traditional IRA and converting it over to a Roth. 
you're paying tax dollars at that point. If you pay tax dollars, if you do it, you want to make sure you take it from non-IRA assets uh, because that diminishes the value of doing there. Um, you do want to try to defer Roth IRAs as long as possible. That's part of the game as well. Um, and, and in terms of, um, you know, can make some sense Roth conversions if it's a state planning technique, meaning especially if you have exposure to estate taxes uh, down the pike, maybe it makes sense to do some of that now. And also, if you're in a 12% tax bracket, we're going to talk a little bit about this next week with taxes. If you can fill up the 12% tax bracket, maybe there's another reason it can make sense to do that in retirement. Um, number four is being, be careful of, of deferred annuities. Uh, deferred annuities, and don't want to say completely stay away from them, but just be aware of what you're getting into. Um, there, there's a couple of different types of deferred annuities out there. Fixed annuities actually can be pretty decent, um, especially their, their uh, fixed rates of return aren't too bad and their expenses are all baked into their interest rate. Uh, but with equity indexed annuities, and again, there's information to booklet on, on those EIAs, equity indexed annuities uh, and variable annuities, advisors love to sell these for a couple of reasons. They're high commissions uh, that uh, for one reason, they're high commissions. Uh, they get a big commission on that, uh, often between six, seven, sometimes even higher percent. So if you have a million dollars and they sell you one of these annuities, they often work, uh, especially variable annuities, six or seven percent is pretty common. You know, they can walk away with 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars pretty darn quickly. So that's a lot of incentive uh, for some folks sometimes to sell that. So be very, very careful uh, on that for that very reason. There are very high expenses and cost uh, in there. A lot of annuities, a lot of those variable annuities, people come and say, it's not growing and I don't know why. And it's because they're so expensive and often I uncover costs of 3% or greater. Uh, extremely complex. So again, not saying don't do it, but know exactly what you're doing before you get into it. There's surrender periods, that meaning you can't get out of those uh, for a period of time or penalties to get out of it in those period of time. A quick story, one of my clients in California, he's a retired doctor. After he retired, uh, before uh, he and I started working together, uh, a, a, a salesperson advisor sold him, had him put about 80 to 90% of his investable assets into this variable deferred annuity. And it just, you know, it was, it was horrible. And there was no way to really recover from that. Uh, so just be very, very careful with, with annuities. Uh, charitable giving, when I said there's seven that we're going to talk about, David Whitenack is going to talk all about this next week. So I jumped ahead. Um, with number six, something that a lot of people uh, think or worry about is a plan for future housing uh, from that standpoint. So some things to think about there, you know, do you want to stay throughout retirement in your current home? At some point, do you want to downsize? Um, do you want to move on to a life care community? So some, so some things to think about earlier in, in retirement uh, until you get, you know, before you get to the point where you have to make a decision. And then finally, um, investment fraud, something that is becoming, uh, unfortunately, a little bit more common. Next week, we're going to talk about identity theft, which is very related, but a little bit different. Uh, investment fr fraud, um, you know, again, most you know, investments, that's the lifeblood of your financial plan. And so make sure you understand and you're very comfortable with anybody you're working with and how you're invested. So don't be afraid to ask, ask questions of anybody that you're working with. Uh, stay involved so you know what's happening. Uh, if you need to have a, you know, the further along get in life, if you have adult children, getting involved, that's often a good thing. We see that a lot in, in, in my business. Uh, work with an advisor you trust. And then the, the last po point here is make sure the custodian of your assets is a reputable company not your advisor. Um, so for example, the name of my company is Conrad Siegel. None of my clients make the, their investment checks payable to Conrad Siegel. That's a bad idea. We use TD Ameritrade as our custodian. That's who's handling the money. If you think back, what was it, 8, 10, 12 years ago, Bernie Madoff, people were making out uh, uh, you know, checks payable for investment to Bernie Madoff. Uh, from, from that one. Uh, so you know, just be very, very careful how you're, you're doing that. So we've reached the conclusion, the last page of this section of the booklet, there's a couple of resources and a couple of articles that are after it. There's a good guy, especially on Medicare. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, like I said, I'm going to email out the electronics files and spreadsheets 
along with the instructional videos. And again, let me know if those are beneficial to you. Uh, if you do miss a session or you enjoy these so much that you just want to watch them over and over and over, um, th these are out on Dairy's e-news uh, that Sue has put out there. So if you can't find them or if you don't get the e-news, let Sue or myself know and we'll steer you in uh, the direction. But next week, here's the excitement of next week, the taxes. Everybody loves taxes and we're getting close to tax time here. Uh, and then greatly looking forward to, and hopefully you are, are as well, uh, to plan giving. Uh, that's a photo of David Whitenack. So apologies to David. May, maybe, maybe he's flattered by the photo. I found it on internet. You know, I found, find if you Google anybody's name on, you know, uh, some pictures will come up. I'm not trying to age David beyond what that is. Maybe that was taken very recently, but that was a photo I grabbed off of the internet. But again, greatly looking forward. David is an expert. His day-to-day -day job is, is working as the director of uh, gift planning at Masonic Villages in Elizabethtown. And this is his wheelhouse. He's been doing some great work and help for the church and stewardship and finance committee. So again, um, we're looking forward to, to hearing that next week. So again, questions that you might have, please go ahead and uh, ask those as time goes along. Um, you know, send me an email throughout the week or whatever it is, and hopefully that's all good. And again, um, appreciate everybody's time tonight, and hopefully you have a good rest of your evening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.